first of all, the, the person who is shopping for just the price, I, I don't know that I fault them because it's, there's, there's a lot of folks that feel like, well, I, I feel like there's a good chance that I'm going to get stuck no matter where I buy from. So I might as well insulate myself best I can by just getting the best price possible and then dealing with it later. I don't like that, but I respect that. But I think you actually hit on one of the, the major things that I look for beyond like, okay, you get online, you can search Google reviews and stuff like that. That's, that's a good resource. But I think you count the service base versus the number of salespeople they have. And I think that that's a really strong indicator for um, the focus and or balance of that place. Now, it can be a little bit tricky because some places have big shops that have like 80 foot long service bays that you can park two river stone fifth wheels in, you know, so you can there. It's a double bay. But how many techs do they have? How many salespeople do they have? If you see like a one-to-one -one ratio, that's usually a good sign that they're they're trying to take care of both the front and back sides of the store. Uh, when you start seeing like twice as many salespeople per service person, they're cranking them out faster than they could ever hope to work on them, more than likely. I'm Rachel. And I'm Joe. And we are two, two crazy, crazy campers. campers. And after losing a combined weight of more than 200 pounds, we realized we had so much more energy for activities. Come along with us as we explore the great outdoors. And join us on a brand new adventure. And this adventure has got me so excited. You're geeking out. I'm totally geeking out. Well, I'm nerding out right now <laughs> because we have the distinct honor and privilege of getting to chat this morning with Josh the RV nerd. I'm really excited about this because when we first started looking for an RV, we came across his video. So as I yeah. think most people do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, recently we put out a video of like, what should you do if you're looking to buy an RV, whether it be your first RV or your 10th RV? And we, one of the things we talk about is watch YouTube videos. Yeah. And my thing is, is don't just watch one person. Like I absolutely love Josh's videos. However, he may have different things and eyes on different things that somebody else may be looking at or not looking at. So it's nice to get a lot of different opinions. It's like we talk about with our keto channel, taste is subjective. Yeah. Well, you know, recently we did a walkthrough of an alliance and somebody in the comments pointed out like, hey, there's no struts on the overhead cabinet. Well, that's not something that I've ever concerned myself with, but obviously it is something that concerns other people. So it's nice when you have different YouTube reviewers having different sets of eyes on there. And, and Josh does that, but then he also tells it like it is. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he wants you to make your best purchase possible and be able to come back to his video and say, hey, this was really helpful. And it was all inclusive. Like, you know, he tells us the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then, you know, helps to make us a more educated consumer. So we're going to interview Josh. We've got a few questions for him about like his channel and things like that. Then I've got some hot seat questions because one thing, like we said, he tells it like it is, but he does ultimately work for an RV dealer in Bish's RV. So I'm curious, is he willing to give us some of the secrets in the way RV companies may be making their money? So let's get into the interview. Welcome, Josh. Hey, I, I always feel like I have a lot to live up to after getting uh, like having a hype man like that. I, it's only going to go downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> so Josh, let's start right off with, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like how did you even get into doing like reviews on YouTube of RVs? Um, my whole career is an accident. Um, <laughs> but basically, um, you know, I, I started working uh, in my family's dealership in 2009, um, and we joined Bish's RV later. My dad wanted to retire. I didn't want to run the show. But way before that, uh, my my dad was trying to sell a horse. They had like uh, various, you know, breeding rights, draft horses, bloodlines, things like that. And there's a lot of money there, and there's very specific. And um, there's certain things that you're looking for. When, that you want to breed into an animal that sometimes a still photo can't capture. And way back when my dad pulled out his um, Motorola flip phone as my mom had a horse on a lunge line and he took a six second grainy video of this horse and texted it to a guy who says, yes, that's the one I want. 
I mean, a, many, many thousands of dollars of horse was sold with six seconds of video. That wasn't even good quality. And he went, there's something to this. So mm -hmm. even though he wasn't a big tech savvy guy, that was my training. I actually have a bachelor's in computer science that's worth about nothing anymore. Um, I, I could take my bachelor's in computer science and I could go get a nose ring and pour coffee for a living at this point. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the thing is, he says, I want you to make videos of these. And what's funny is I was like, no, I think that's a bad idea, which is really funny because that's literally become the only thing that I'm known for doing. But um, yeah, that's what my, my boss told me to do. And my job's not to find a way to tank it. My job was to find a way to make it work. And I was the first guy to record an RV. I was on the early edge of that, I think. And I didn't have a dedicated cameraman. I didn't have the wireless microphones like the talk shows. I, I didn't have any of that. I had no budget. And that's actually the whole reason I started a YouTube channel. Is when I started it, YouTube used to be different. It wasn't about the algorithms and it wasn't about viewership time and clicks. It was just like a video hosting site and you linked off of YouTube to play videos elsewhere. And that was the whole point. I needed a free way to, to host a lot of video content because we couldn't afford server space. We were a small mom and pop shop. And I, I realized that YouTube was free. So I leveraged, exploited, whatever word you want that. And it later just became a whole thing. What is something that you find people are asking for when you make a video of this sort versus what you think is important for them to know? I think sometimes we as the viewer are thinking, hey, we'd like this information, but you as somebody who has so much experience in like the seller aspect of it knows other questions that we should really be asking as viewer. I, I think the, the number one question that I get because it's not something you do find in my videos, is what's the price of this thing? Which is a perfectly good question. But I don't, the thing there is, I don't think people realize that it's not like an Amazon listing. YouTube's not like Amazon where you can click the buy it now button. And my videos, for lack of a better way of saying it, live a long time. You know, they're intended to each represent an RV for about a year. And manufacturers change stuff. And we have 23 stores. And I, I did some looking one time at, um, a Jayco Eagle fifth wheel shipped to my local store in Southern Michigan versus our other stores as you start going further west. And my local store, it's a couple hundred bucks of shipping dollars. Um, and, and naturally, that all eventually passes through to the customer and gets reflected on a price tag. Only a couple states away in Iowa, it's like two grand. By the time you get to Idaho, it's four. To get it to my uh, Oregon store, is like close to five grand per unit to get shipped out there. So they're like, what is the price? Well, there's not the price price. There's prices on each individual RV. So I've always left links in my video descriptions where <clears throat> you can, you never have to call a salesperson. You can see actual real world pricing in that RV, even if you watch the video three years later, because I, I had a comment this morning on a video from 2014. Someone wants to know if it's still available. I don't know that people realize recency necessarily on YouTube. Beyond that, I really try to go with whatever questions people do answer like or ask. Like recently here, more and more people are, are wanting to know what slide out system is equipped on an RV. So I've tried to touch on that more often in my videos. And I have this really crazy policy of trying to give people what they want. I know it's weird, but that's that's where I try to roll. Is the information that you're looking for, the questions I get frequently, that's what I want to hit on. And I do try to specifically more often talk about things you can't see because you know, you can see it's a theater seat. I don't need to tell you that it has a toilet and a microwave. I'm pretty sure you can discern that by watching the video. I want to try to give you the extra information that you can't necessarily see. Like, does it have tank heaters? That kind of thing. One of the things that you do in your videos that I find invaluable, and honestly, I mean, we even do YouTube, we do walkthroughs of RVs when we go to like the Florida RV Super Show and things like that. But there's things that you can do being on a lot with a lot of different brands that like we can't do at a show. And the thing that you do that I don't think anybody else does is show road mode. For us, road mode is super important. We're weekend warriors. And listen, I'm towing my bathroom behind me. So if I'm doing a three, four, seven hour drive, I don't want to 
like pull over at a service center and go inside and use the bathroom and get a drink. I would want to go out to my RV and grab what's there. And so for us, road mode is super important. What can I access without opening the slides? And I don't know of anybody else that does that. What made you start going, let me show you what it looks like with the slides closed. Once again, just literally the comment section, just doing what people are looking for. Because if you watch my videos, I've been doing it for years now, but five, six years ago, I didn't typically record things with slides closed. Um, because I mean, in, in my head, a lot of the people around me would say, it's not a big deal. You just push the button, but more and more people are asking. And it's like, you could push the button, but maybe that's not what everyone's looking for. And that's why you have all these different RVs and all these different companies, and different floor plans. They each have different benefits. They each have different drawbacks. So let's find out where they all shine and where they don't, because we, we have so much stuff available to us. If that's not the right one, good. Let's figure that out now before you spend the thousands of dollars. There was one specific viewer who just really for like a year did not relent on it. And um, I, I can't remember their exact screen name, but <clears throat> they're still watching today. And it's funny, I, I don't hear from them very much anymore because I, I fulfilled all their requests. So now they just watch and they don't comment as much. But um, I, I think the reason you don't see more people doing that is because it's it's it takes way more time than I think people realize. And you guys putting together content. I think like sometimes people ask me what I think about another content creator or is that guy my competition? I don't think we really see each other that way because you tend to either make or watch content. And when you make it and you see someone else makes it, even if you don't watch their stuff, even if you don't necessarily even agree or like what they do, it takes a lot of work and you respect the effort that has to go into it. Um, you know, if, if you're watching 30 seconds to one minute of me recording a road mode video, that took 10, 15 minutes to capture. And also, if I'm operating on battery power, I've only got so much of that available. You know, it's it's resource management as much as anything. So it's it's a it's a tricky dance. But I know that that's an important one. So I really have tried to incorporate that in everything that I can, especially when you have more and more, you know, people who boondock or people who don't want to pay to be in an RV resort, maybe just overnight. Like we're, <clears throat> we're going to be driving up to Elkhart in the first week of April. And it's like, I don't want to pay a hundred dollars to stay in an RV resort to sleep overnight. And so I'm going to pull into a cracker barrel or maybe a truck stop or something like that. Well, in, in a lot of those areas, you can't really open your slides. You don't want to open your slide in a truck stop and have a trucker take your, your slide out. So for us, it's important to know, like, what can I get away with without having those slides open? One other thing I, I want to mention is just how, uh, you know, I have been in it for a minute. I've been doing this for 15 years now. And um, it, it's like if I, I leave all my videos up there since I, I first started posting stuff. And sometimes you'll hear my messaging change because I've learned things as I've gone through this industry, things that I didn't used to know. You've heard my towing recommendations change. You've even heard my road mode recommendations change the last couple of years since I started learning more of this undisclosed information that's out there in the industry. Like used to be, I would say things like, okay, when the slide's closed, we lose the bedroom, but hey, there's a dinette over here in the slide that you could sleep in overnight if you need to. And I used to say that. And then I learned more about the fact that RV manufacturers don't, uh, in the towable industry are different from motorized. They don't test for those slides to be occupied by people they didn't plan for when they're retracted because they're not properly supported. That never occurred to me. I never knew any of that before. So, you know, unfortunately, I, I, I don't always have the perfect information to put out there. But as I've learned new things and put new things out, you've watched a lot of the information that I provide and put into my videos or like special, not just reviews, but topical videos kind of change over time. I have a whole video dedicated to like, demystifying, you know, slide out use and like, hey, here's this system or this system. Here's where they're good. Here's where they're not. Here's what you shouldn't do with them, like slide supports. I just don't think you should ever, ever use those things now that I've learned about them, you know. So you mentioned, so you were a family owned business in Halet RV mm -hmm. and then you, you know, you guys merged, I guess, with Bishes. What has it been like going from a small family owned RV store to a nationwide store like Bish's. Have there been changes? Have you enjoyed the changeover? Yeah, there's always going to be some kind of change. And I think that's one of the reasons um, my, my home store here, of all the employees that we had when we joined the Bish's team, only one didn't stay on board because my dad said, I think probably the smartest thing he could have to any of them 
He said, I'm not going to insult you and sit here and say that nothing's going to change. I, that really hit me and I passed that messaging along in my videos during that transitional period. But I think if people really stand back and look, because there was a lot of people like, oh, here we go. It's, uh, the messaging is going to become a corporatized or something like that. But it, it took about six months and I started seeing viewers in the comment section saying stuff like, you know, we were really worried, but it really is just you behind the camera. And the funny thing about me is like, I work, even though I, I work for Bishes with Bishes, I'm like 99% autonomous. I have an office here in my hometown store where I've always been for the last 15 years. And that's where I'm standing here talking to you right now. But I just cruise around and I get to kind of do my own thing. So a lot of that hasn't really changed for me. What's been nice is the exposure that I've been able to gain to all these different brands and different companies and manufacturers, uh, you know, that that I've never had a chance to, to interact with before. You know, like I got a chance to really meet, um, you know, the all the people over at Alliance over there, like the Brady Boys and Bill Martin and all of them. And uh, I, and I never, I just never had the opportunity before and, and the, the opportunities that has then created for me has been really, really cool because, you know, I always wondered how many times are people going to watch me record the same RV every year before they finally get tired of it. And I was getting tired of it. And now it's just like drinking from a fire hose. It was amazing. We actually love the walkthrough that you did of the Alliance warehouse. It was just so informative. And I always love how you also uh, you're breaking it down in live time, but you're also, you know, to the side of the screen, breaking down like even, you know, more um, specific. How does this affect things? Why is this important? Like, why is this information like different in, you know, in this place than it is any uh, other place? And I think that that's so amazing. And another thing, you know, for us in South Florida and in other regions of the country that can't benefit necessarily from being able to purchase their RV from Bishes, you, you still bring to our awareness the importance of, you know, shopping your dealer and making sure that you have a reputable dealer. And something that Joe had said just was like, as soon as he heard you say it was like, gosh, this is a good guy. Why is it important for you um, to inform your viewers about the importance of shopping a dealer? Well, I mean, especially in the new RV market, there's more than one place that has anything that you could look at. None of this is unique to that store, despite how much effort there may be to try to present that uh, idea. Um, the fact is, uh, you learn who you're really doing business with when things don't go according to plan, when you have a problem, when you had some kind of service need. And, you know, sales sells the first one and service sells all the rest of them. And it's really, really important to know who you're doing business with and the, the quality of character that they have. Are they going to be there when you need them? You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we're perfect. You know, we're the only good place out there. There's plenty of very good places that are not part of the Bishes RV, you know, family of stores or whatever you want to call it. I've met some very good places out there. And there's a bunch of places that are really trying to do good. But sometimes there it can be hard and there's roadblocks. But I don't think that shopping for an RV should have to be like shopping for a cell phone carrier. You have, you know what I mean? We're like, you had, say, Sprint or Verizon or T-Mobile or whoever, and one of them cheesed you off. So then you switch to the next carrier until they cheese you off. And eventually you end up right back where you started. And you're just like, hi, me again, you know? <laughs> that's that's not how shopping an RV should be. It, it shouldn't be a question of which dealership got your business. It's which one earned your business. And that can be easier said than done because, um, you know, the, the customer-facing uh rhetoric or whatever you want to say sounds really positive from all of them. Of course, they all think that they're a good place to do business with. And um, I think that there's things, you know, like Better Business Bureau reviews are maybe a place to look, um, you know, Google reviews, all that, because you can't fake that stuff necessarily. We've literally received bad reviews that come in and looked at it and went, that's, that's not one of our customers. We have no idea what this is. But through the aggregate, if uh, you, you find a place that's like 4.4 .4 to 4.5 stars and above, it has to be because more often than not, they are doing the best that they can for folks. And, um, you know, you, you're the, the hard truth, the really ugly hard truth is that at some point, you're probably going to need some screws tightened and some wrench and done on any one of these things. And that bums me. You can hear it in my voice. That bums me out saying that. But if we're going to call a spade a spade, a duck a duck, 
you need a place that can do more than just sell you one. You, it's really good to have a place that can take care of you if things don't go according to plan. What are some tips that you could give people to find a good RV deal? I, I don't want to name names on what a lot of people know is this may be a bad dealership, but what are some things that we could look for when you know we're looking for an RV dealer, we're looking at an RV that we could kind of use to go, well, that's a good dealer. Like recently I was on one of the forums on Facebook and someone was like, I'm just looking for the best price. I'm like, that's not the smartest thing. The price is one thing, but how many service bays do they have? Are they going to be there for you later? Like you were mentioning earlier, transportation costs. An RV in South Florida costs a lot more money than an RV that you're going to buy in Ohio because it had to travel a lot longer. So, and you may have to go back to that original dealer. So what are some things that people could look for in, in shopping for not just the RV, but the dealer itself? First of all, the, the person who is shopping for just the price, I, I don't know that I fault them because it's, there's there's a lot of folks that feel like, well, I, I feel like there's a good chance that I'm going to get stuck no matter where I buy from. So I might as well insulate myself best I can by just getting the best price possible and then dealing with it later. I don't like that, but I respect that. But I think you actually hit on one of the, the major things that I look for beyond like, okay, you get online, you can search Google reviews and stuff like that. That's, that's a good resource. But I think you count the service bays versus the number of salespeople they have. And I think that that's a really strong indicator for um, the focus and or balance of that place. Now, it can be a little bit tricky because some places have big shops that have like 80 foot long service bays that you can park two river stone fifth wheels in, you know, so you can there. It's a double bay. But how many techs do they have? How many salespeople do they have? If you see like a one to one ratio, that's usually a good sign that they're they're trying to take care of both the front and back sides of the store. Uh, when you start seeing like twice as many salespeople per service person, they're cranking them out faster than they could ever hope to work on them, more than likely. And there's no hard rules, but that's a really big indicator that I really suggest looking for. Another one, um, again, kind of, uh, I call it trying them on for size. Like if you're, uh, I don't care if you're going to shop a pop-up, uh, kind of like Rachel mentioned, you know, when you call a place, uh, I think it's a really interesting litmus test for how much do they care about you potentially is uh, pick out the biggest, heaviest fifth wheel in their entire lineup and say, hey, I'm kind of interested in this thing. If they're one of the very first questions they ask is not, what are you towing it with? Um, or are you going to have us deliver it to a permanent site or something like that? I, I don't think that they really care about anything other than getting your business and not earning it. There's a few things like that that I, I really recommend looking for. Another one, um, this is another one of those things that has really not earned me a lot of friends necessarily within this industry, but I believe in it. As a, if, as a consumer myself, I don't spend it, my money any different than you, is I don't care if it's new or used. If you're considering buying an RV, especially as a first timer, you don't know what you don't know. You don't even, you're not even sure what you're looking at. You're just told that it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, is consider hiring the services of an independent third party inspector. You can Google RV inspector near me and you're going to come up with something most of the time, especially if you're in uh, a really high volume RV area like Texas, Florida, Michigan, California. There's plenty of RV inspector business around there. Um, you know, again, you don't know what you don't know, and they can be that extra safety net. And if a place goes, no, we don't allow that. I don't know. That feels weird. Why not? Because I remember when I got my house financed, the bank said I had to have it inspected first. Why wouldn't I want my RV inspected to protect me from pre-existing conditions? Also, it, it just seems like a thing that exists in other areas of our lives. Why not this one necessarily? But that's uh, that's kind of a hot take that not everyone necessarily agrees with. Would you recommend an inspection even on a brand new year? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I've, um, e even among my my stores, you know, I, I like our team. I like what we do. Uh, again, though, I'll never claim we're perfect. So even just putting us on the block, again, like you said, I, I don't want to put anyone out. I'm not trying to put someone else on blast. So let's just focus the attention on us. We're not perfect. We've made mistakes and we've had inspectors catch things. Um, different stores may have different policies. Again, some places might be like, yeah, sure. We'll just pull it up, let them look at it and just send us the report. Some places are going to tell you, no, you can't do that. We used to just let people, yeah, just send the inspector and look at it. And we ran into a situation where we had someone who, uh, you know, they're the reason we can't have nice things. They pencil whipped an inspection report with eight pages of defects that we were generally not able to locate like dents and scratches in the bumper that weren't there, you know? 
And um, so if you send an inspector our way, we're happy to have them. We'll pull the unit up. But we do require one of our techs be with them. But there's other benefits to that because if there is something, now we have one of our people who speaks our internal language who can literally see this and write up a proper work order to get this resolved for somebody. Um, And I would prefer that they didn't need to do that. But it's a lot easier and faster to resolve everything when you have someone standing right there who knows what needs fixed. Versus trying to read someone else's notes. That's that's not easy. People don't realize that these RVs travel to the dealerships on the road. Sometimes people roll their eyes to this, but it, it's a real thing. RVs are an earthquake inside and a hurricane outside while you're towing them. Like if, if, um, if you would have heard on the news this morning that there were 70 mile an hour winds with 120 mile an hour gusts, you'd be like, oh my gosh, people are going to die. But Think about it when you're towing an RV down the highway. That's literally the experience that they're going through. And um, unfortunately, sometimes things just rattle trap a little bit more than you would like them to. And they uh, they need some fixing. I've seen personal situations. I personally walked a person through an RV on the day they were taking it home. Show them how the microwave worked even. All the, all the things. They took it 30 minutes away down a paved highway, got it home, and the microwave doesn't work. Had to be replaced. Just just the stupidest things happen sometimes, even if you do check them. So what is something that people should be on the lookout for when it comes to potential um, dealer add-ons? Things that you don't necessarily need, but but they look great on the listing. I mean, we we've, we run into that with, when we're buying cars, right? Because they add paint things. Paint protection packages. Paint protection and like specialty, you know, things in the floorboard. So what are some potential uh, things that people should look out for when it comes to buying an RV? I think the biggest thing on those um, add-on products or services is being told that the bank would not complete your lending unless you bought these extra things, because that is a bald-faced lie. It is illegal. It is a violation of truth in lending laws in our country. The problem is most of your consumers don't know that. I didn't know that until I was in this business and learned it from my finance guys. There can be benefits to some of those services. Like I'm not handy. Um, so like I bought a vehicle recently. I, I got the, uh, you know, the, the factory extended warranty on it. And I've used it twice and it's been great for me. Now, if I was really handy, I would have saved that money and I wouldn't have done that. But, uh, you know, in in RVs, you can get pretty far if you're personally very handy because there's not a whole lot of computerized stuff to them anymore. Um, The the thing, though, is when you start getting into a lot of these add-on services and memberships and extended service contracts and all that, um, there are a lot of places that will flat tell you uh, that, the, the bank would not approve your loan unless you did this. That's a lie. That's illegal. If you get them recorded saying that, they're in hot water. The problem is no one's ever recording with your phone when you sit down with the, the I don't know, finance guy or whoever it, that is doing your paperwork with you. And uh, so they can kind of get away with it, you know. I think the best suggestion I can give you on any of these add-on things other than just the RV, you know, after you've financed it, or even if you don't finance it, these things are still available. When in doubt, leave it out. If you're not sure, leave it out. Because typically, these are often things that could be added, activated, applied later. They don't necessarily always have to be done right away. Um, What a lot of people call extended warranties are not actually extended warranties. They're third-party service contracts. Uh, there, there, it's not an extension of your RV manufacturer warranty. The other thing a lot of people don't know on that, if you don't use those things, typically you can get your money back. A lot of times you're going to have to fight somebody for it, which is stupid. But the fact is, if you, you do buy into the extended service contract or extended warranty or whatever you want to call it, and you don't use it, if you keep that paperwork, go back to your dealership and tell them, I didn't use this. I want this refunded. And most of the time uh, you can do that or at least prorate the portion you haven't used. A lot of people don't even realize a lot of times these extended service plans, they are they they take they don't really work until after your f- factory warranty has ended. So, you know, you buy a four year plan, but you're really only getting three years because in that first year they're going to go back. Wait a second. You have a factory warranty that takes precedence. And I would always advise people if you're going to get it, get get it after the fact, like Josh talked about. I mean, there, there is a very well-known, without naming names, a very large dealership 
you know, that has stores all over the country that sells an extended service plan. And you could literally go buy the same exact extended service plan that they're going to sell you in that little glass booth after the fact from the same company for half the price. The average consumer doesn't know that. And that's why we're doing these little talks here to help uh, demystify and explain and educate people because the average person doesn't know that. They're sitting across from the person who they're supposed to be able to trust to shoot them straight. And if that person isn't on the up and up, it's it's just a bad recipe. It's it's it, it's a good situation to end up uh, with a bad time. And especially when they end up putting a three thousand dollar service contract that's going to last for four years into a ten to fifteen year loan, it will easily become the most expensive thing ever. That's that's another thing that I do recommend, just as a pro tip for anybody listening, as much as you can try try not to finance pieces, parts, accessories, things like that. Because if you finance a weight distribution hitch on a travel trailer, it will easily become the most expensive hitch in your life by the time you're done with that loan. You, If you actually look at the amortization of that hitch, a, a $500 hitch will end up easily costing you $1,700 over the course of a, I don't know, a 12-year loan. One of the things that we love about your channel is you are so brutally honest about things. I try. Thank you. And so something that I wanted to talk about is you, you do like monthly or every every so often like state of the industry update videos. Recently, you actually put a, I think it was a phenomenal video about the, the big issue that everyone seems to be talking about right now is frame flex. What, what are your thoughts on the whole state of the industry right now? Quality control, the frame flex issue, you know, all of the things that people are thinking, you know, people are saying, oh, well, the quality is just as bad now as it was in 2020. What do you think? What are your thoughts on the current state of the industry itself? In, in terms of a quality talk, I don't think it's, uh, at least in my career, really ever been where people would prefer it to be, where I, I think it necessarily should be. Uh the the hard part is it, it's it's not always easy to sniff out and discern that. Um, I, I I think for me a lot of what the the current state of things boils down to is that there is an intrinsic culture in the RV industry, and I'm not pointing fingers specifically just at manufacturers. I think that this translates into RV dealerships as well, and just this um, withholding of all the information that they possibly can to keep consumers in it is in the dark as absolutely possible as they can. To make their lives, I don't know, easier? I'm not sure. But I just, I, I don't know. I, I, I've never shopped that way. I've never tried to present information that way. And I, I, I think that if we had more clarity and more information um, available to dealerships and consumers directly, not even, the, I don't think dealer or customers should have to get information specifically from dealerships. I think dealerships should be an additional resource available to them. But uh, if, if we had more things that were available to properly set everyone's expectations, I think that we would have, uh, you know, fewer folks having bad situations because they would have been able to, to steer themselves away from that in the first place. I think that that's true of almost every aspect of this business because there's so much information that I think is important for consumers to know that even as a dealership, I, I really don't know that I can always get it accessible to me a lot of the time. It's it's very, very frustrating. I do think uh, manufacturers, suppliers are realizing that we live in this age of this thing called the internet that's not this passing fad that's not going away and that uh, people are looking for more information that uh, you could say than ever before, but we have more information available than ever before. And I think that a lot of this is information that people always would have wanted in the first place. Not that it well, it's more information than they ever had before. Well, because we never gave them anything before. We gave them a printed brochure and told them, boy, this thing's fantastic. Um, that's that's not really being helpful. So we didn't exactly set the bar very high as an industry. Um, I think more manufacturers are realizing this. Actually, something I thought was really, really cool is Coley Brady from Alliance called me Saturday. And uh, just on my personal time, he goes, so, you know, we're, we're kind of just looking at the state of things, you know, We've always tried to, you know, be what we feel is better for our clients, share more information for our clients. Like, what, how do you think we could do more? And I started explaining some ideas like, um, I'm, uh, like, okay, so that actual assembled unit, you could measure the hitch weight and you could give that information to a customer, but nobody does that. And despite the fact that, you know, um, you know, Coley and Ryan, 
basically grew up in this business. You know, it's just part of their DNA. You know, their dad founded Heartland. I mean, they're not new to this industry whatsoever, but that had never been done. And in all these years, it just never occurred to anyone to do that. And uh, he said, well, you know, we, we, we measure our units and our brochure weights are typically pretty close. And I said, okay, what if we take a paradigm, but then you add an optional generator? Now, how much hitch weight does it have? He goes, oh, I get what you're talking about. Now nobody knows. I, I thought it was really interesting that he was really receptive to kind of thinking about how they could uh, not try to, to keep doing what's been done, but how could they do it better? And some manufacturers are going to adopt that more quickly than others. I think the smaller and more independent uh, a manufacturer is, the better it will be. But I've seen, um, I recently talked to um, the uh, VP of customer service at Forest River, and they're seriously talking about a major climate shift within their company. And when you think of a big organism like Forest River changing the the, the whole focal point of, of how they go about their business, that's a monster undertaking. But it is something that they're trying to do. And it's not easy and it's going to take time and they're going to stumble and nobody's perfect. But I do feel like manufacturers are realizing that they not only maybe could do better, but should do better. And I think any conversation like that, it applies to a manufacturer, absolutely could and should apply equally to an RV dealership. Because um, I, I, I think that there's a lot of perception that there's a lot of finger pointing between customers and manufacturers. And dealership's just a middleman. That's an absolute cop out. We are absolute, that is our customer sitting there with a problem and we need to uh, take responsibility for them, take care of them to the best of our ability as well. And that doesn't seem to be a, something that's been a big car, part of the conversation out there that I think definitely should be. Do you think that some of these up and coming independent RV manufacturers like Alliance and Brinkley are sort of, you know, posing that to the larger manufacturers, making it more of an incentive for them to revamp some things and refresh some things within their, you know, older companies? I, I think in a way that uh, they're, 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 they're exposing the fact that a, there's a different way available and it, it will essentially drag everyone forward, whether they want to or not. And some brands will, some brands will, will uh, stay a, a, as regressive in a sense as they can. But at the end of the day, um, the the brands that are like like if you look through RV show season right now, the brands that are um, generating the greatest level of consumer confidence are the brands that are doing best during show season. Uh, and there there have definitely been some climate shifts there compared to the previous couple of years in terms of which companies are seeing um, show season success and which aren't. Uh, because there are plenty of consumers who still want to do this or are still very willing, but if it doesn't check the boxes, if it doesn't make me feel good, I'm not going to do it, you know. And um, there's enough things out there that consumers have that choice. And I think that they should have that choice. What are your thoughts on these new upcoming independent RV manufacturers like Brinkley and like Alliance where, you know, so Alliance, they kind of got the short end of the stick. They launched in 2019 and then wham, COVID happens. I when we were going around in the Florida RV Super Show, you heard people going, "These Brinkleys are awesome," but they've only been around for a year. Like, what are your thoughts when people go, "Like, I don't know, are they going to stick around?" I think that that's a very good question. I think you have to look at kind of who's uh, running the ship necessarily. And in in reference to the two companies that you mentioned right there, these are newer companies. These are not newer people to the RV industry. They have been around and they have done this for a while. Um, as far as I know, I do I have access to their profit and loss statements? No, of course not. But as far as I'm able to discern, uh, the two companies that you mentioned are very sound and not going anywhere. They both continue to grow. They both have continued to invest in infrastructure, invest in their people. And those are good signs of someone who's laying proper groundwork to be stable and to stick around. So I don't, I like, it's, it's a very good question, but Someone operating on that scale, I I think um, they're, they're pretty solid. They have well-established dealer bodies. They've found popularity. They have earned uh, good customer reputations. Um, and uh, I, I don't foresee that being a, a scary kind of thing. If it's a, a very small little place that has more regional distribution, only a couple dealerships, yeah, that can be a little scary. I have seen a couple small little entities uh, for one reason or another fold, but there also have been instances like I always thought Evergreen was really cool stuff. I thought Evergreen was a really cool RV company. 
um, that was willing to be exciting and different and fresh. And uh, unfortunately, it only took like one financial guy to take some money and like skip to like Costa Rica or something like that. And that was the end of it. That's basically what happened to Pilgrim RV as well. It took the money guy, just went, eh, I'm going to empty the bank accounts today. Bye. Okay, so Josh, we got three, maybe four questions. <laughs> We're going to put you on the spot a little bit, but we'll start off with an easy one. What do you love about RV? It's not the RV. It's The RV is just a medium to the actual thing that we're doing here. And that's fun, fun memories, opportunities. You know, um, I, I have become a person as I've become a parent. I've realized the value in not in spending money on things, but spending money on experiences. And I think that the RV is just the medium to accomplish that experience. Some of my favorite memories growing up were camping with my family and we had a 20 foot no slide cream colored basic bare bones camper like anybody had one of those overhead cabinets that became a bunk that was my bed you know that's how I got into <laughs> camping um whereas uh you know I think that there's a lot of folks oh it's got fireplaces and this and that that's just that's just the um that's just the mechanism and the medium through which the fun and the lifestyle actually happens because when you're actually out there when you're doing it it is such a good time so for somebody who is considering getting into the RV lifestyle, what would you say is the biggest mistake people make when shopping for an RV? This is a really easy thing to say. It's a really hard thing to do. And I call it finding your second camper the first time. I, I think that there's a couple pitfalls. Like people don't think about how they're going to be using this three or five years from now, but they finance them for 10, 12, 15 years. <laughs> you know, like if you've got kids who are age 12 and 13, you think, oh, I need a bunkhouse. But in only a couple years, most of the time, a lot of these kids are not hanging out with mom and dad like they used to. And now you finance for 10, 12, 15 years, an RV that only worked for two or three and you want to swap out of it. That's not a good position to be in. Um, trying to, to, to look ahead a little bit uh, to, to think what, okay, this is maybe what I need now. What might I need in the future? One of the biggest hiccups that a person could make who's an absolute first timer is buying a new RV first. I think one of the best recommendations I can make, going back to the you don't know what you don't know if you're a first timer, I think one of the first things you should do is try to rent or borrow an RV. Um, and I think the first one you should buy, you may seriously consider a used RV. There's a lot of different reasons for it I can get into if you want me to. I don't know how much time we have, but it's a it's a it's a ni a better way to insulate yourself. Uh, you know, when you're making a very, very big purchase, whether you want to get into or out of it, it's a lot easier to do it that way. I really appreciate the fact that you shared about like borrowing or renting, because that's something that I, I think people need an expert to share. Like this is worth it. You're about to purchase something that's tens of thousands or more dollars, but sometimes we are penny wise and pound foolish and don't bother to like rent something for a weekend to see if this RV is really livable because, you know, you still see it uh, something bright and shiny on the dealer lot. And you're thinking, I think a rear kitchen is what we really need. Or I think we need a toy hauler, or I think we need a bunkhouse, but until you sleep in it and you have to like sleep in that bed, we learned right away that the positioning of the bed was super important. Like, am I going to have to crawl over my partner in the middle of the night in order to get to the bathroom? So I really, really appreciate you sharing about just, you know, possibly renting it, it, it may save you actually, you know, living in something that, that doesn't fit you perfectly. Well, I look at our RV. I mean, we, again, we bought used and I think that our RV was, it was one of those situations. We bought it in 2020, um, right before the, the prices went ballistic. I think that it was probably used once or twice. Like there was still plastic on things when we walked into it. So I'm pretty sure that whoever owned ours, it was one of those situations. They bought it and either A, they said, yeah, not for me. And they immediately traded it in or B, they decided, well, I need a different type of unit. And so we lucked out, but I look at now. So we're in 2024, we're selling our RV. Had we not bought a used RV, we'd be in a serious financial hole right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're getting back at least what we paid for it in what we're, what we're selling it for. But if you bought a brand new RV in 2020, 2021, 
you might have issues because the prices got so inflated. Okay, so let's put you on the spot for a second. You're you're just an RV buyer mm -hmm. with a lot of knowledge. You're you're not a dealer. You don't work for a dealership. How can somebody get the best deal on an RV if they're going to buy their first RV? Well, the you, you have to do what nobody wants to do because it feels like homework and it's not fun. You need to shop around and you need to kind of play some folks against one another effectively. I don't like that phrasing, but um, before you get there, a very important thing you need to do is, it's going to sound funny, but ignore what is listed as the price tag because that's not what's actually coming out of your pocket. Like people look at this RV for an MSRP of $30,000 and they look at the sale price of $21,000. They're like, well, holy cow, that's got to be a screaming deal. But you don't know what else might be added to that price tag because not every dealership operates in the same way. So who is advertising the lowest sale price may not actually have the lowest out the door price. And I always tell people, do you care what the price tag says or do you care what's coming out of your wallet? Because I care what's coming out of my wallet personally. And the way that you kind of help smoke that out and avoid that, I, I, I always tell people when you're shopping, basically act like you have one personal check left in your checkbook. And that is the check that is going to be written to buy the RV. You're going to write one check for this RV and never pay anyone another cent. What is the hard number that has to be written on that check to take the thing home today? Not what am I sending to the lender after my money down, but if I did this all in one shot and wrote you one check, what is the total combined purchase number for this? And that's how you smoke out all those games. And that's the number you need to shop for. You need to shop for the true out the door number. And you have to be really careful. I'll privately, quietly comp shop some places and they'll say things like, well, yeah, that's it, it'll be this many dollars out the door plus taxes and, and fees. What do you mean? That's not out the door then. I, I need to know the, la the, like if I had coffee can cash, if I buried cash in a coffee can in my backyard, how much of that cash do I have to take out of the coffee can to hand you to take possession of this and be done with it? And you need to probably try to get that figure from a couple places and then decide, um, you know, price versus uh, locality versus what you estimate to be service uh, factors uh, based on reputation factors that you're able to locate. You're going to have to go with the one that kind of feels right to you. And I, I'll, I'll just say, trust your instincts. If it doesn't look right, if it doesn't feel right and smell right, it's probably not right. And uh, again, there's more than one place that is more than happy to sell you one of these things. And there's some places that do it very, very nicely. And uh, it's your choice as a consumer how you want to go about that. Can people get a better deal at RV shows over going to a local dealer? I used to say absolutely not. Um, because the invoice cost of that camper sitting right there on the lot today is exactly the same as when it's at the RV show. But at the RV show, we had to pay for the facility, the advertising, the, the fuel to get it there, the transportation people. We had to house and feed people. It's a very, very expensive thing. And I, I'm not going to shy away from the fact that we're not doing that out of the goodness of our hearts. We are a for-profit business. I feel like everyone's uh, afraid to say that. At the end of the day, you go to work to, to make money. Now you can do it how how you choose to do it, I think, determines, you know, the, the type of business that you are there. But um, and, and when you you look at it like that, yeah, the the RV at the RV show, it, I mean, how could it be cheaper? But after uh, being part of a bigger organization, sometimes uh, you'll find where there are opportunities where uh, your your factory rep is authorized uh, to offer an additional discount off of that invoice of X dollars. Um, per copy during the show event. That is a thing that does realistically happen that doesn't always happen. Um, actually, there was a really interesting case where uh, we added a new brand to my home store. My home store had a show right after this where we featured that new brand. So we, uh, when you first sign a brand, a lot of times we have um, incentivized uh, initial dealer pricing, new dealer pricing that, that goes away after that initial batch of orders. Well, on top of that, we also got some factory help to have even lower prices at an RV show. And I recorded one of these units in my videos uh, where we had our sale price posters all over the place. And this unit was listed at 25.9 at that show. And that was real. That was just plus taxes and tags. But after we lost all those initial new dealer and show incentives, that trailer jumped to 32.9 on our website. And everyone was really like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not what it, it, the price tag showed in the, in the, uh, in the um, poster. So, there are legitimate instances in which there are 
um, incentives available. The problem is, as a consumer, I don't know how you actually know what's real and what's not. I know as a dealership what's real and what's not to me. But anything I say to you, of course, it's suspect. Of course, I would say that, right? So you have to take anything I say with a healthy dose of paranoia. I don't blame you for that. I have to ask you, what lately has got you just excited as far as new in, in new innovations in recent years? There have been um, so many new floor plans recently here because during the whole pandemic production era, manufacturers did not have the bandwidth to create new models. Like it, we really got into a very comfortable cycle where every year this company may, um, they may drop three or four floor plans. They may introduce three or four new floor plans with each of their series every year. So it was a constant evolving thing. Um, and during the pandemic production uh, period, that stopped because manufacturers did not have the time to do anything but create what already existed to just make a lot, a lot of copies of it. Something that actually has me very, very excited for a number of reasons, though, you talked about tech, is uh, um, ABS systems and what and all the different things that they could do. I personally feel that ABS has the potential to reshape this industry to solve so many of those um, lacking information questions that uh, I mentioned earlier. So first of all, just from the just the obvious thing, what it does, it provides towing safety. And I'm a big fan of anything towing safety wise, you know, you know, since 1998, semi tractor trailers, the, the trailers have been required to have ABS on them. And that is something that is being towed by a professionally trained driver. Meanwhile, folks like you and me staring at each other on this little uh, video call, we took driver's training for the first, last, and only time at age 16, and ain't nobody going to tell me anything else. You know what I mean? That's that's the general culture of our country. We don't typically have special licensing, special training, but according to anybody, we are equally qualified to hook up to a 45-foot fifth wheel with a giant truck and tow 60-foot of death machine down the road without yep. the safety equipment that is required of a professional driver. Does that any, yeah. None of this sounds right when I say it out loud, right? Am I? It really doesn't. You know, I, I see people comment like, I don't really need a weight distribution hitch. I don't need an any sway bar. I mean, we, we have a pro pride hitch Ooh, nice. because I'm like, I want the safest thing that I could possibly have. It's my, my, we're in the car. One of the other things that I'm really excited about ABS is how, like I said, I think it, I think it may serve as a potential access point or, or, or medium through which uh, a major industry change from the ground up could take place um, in that ABS tracks wheel revolutions. ABS can, can the RV now has a way to tell you how much it's been towed. And I know that some vehicles have a thing where when you plug into it, it'll tell you how many miles you've changed, you've towed a trailer. Um, I, I get that some vehicles have that, but one of the, the challenges that we're running into a lot of the discussions in the RV industry, like we talked about the, 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 it, the we could call it frame flex. If we're going to call a spade a spade frame failure situation yeah is um, something that is not widely known that I, I, a lot of people in my comment section of my video, when I talked about it, they're like, what are you talking about? I've never heard this before. RVs are engineered with an expectation of here's how much this one is supposed to be used. But that information gets left on the cutting room floor by the time it goes through the marketing department to the dealerships, through our mouths, out to a customer. So a lot of times dealers never know, and there's no way for a customer to know what is the intended expected usage for the thing that you're about to spend lots and lots of money on? You're told you can do it all you want, or at least that's the impression that you're given. So I can never fault a consumer for using something the way that they thought they could because nobody told them anything to the contrary. The fact is these things are not necessarily made to be towed all around all the time. And a lot of people said, that's ridiculous. You're telling me I can only tow it so much and, my, and then I don't have a warranty anymore. And I, I want to shift from RVs to vehicles real quick. Vehicle warranties are delimited by time and mileage. So this is a normal practice that does exist in everyday American society. But when we shift over to RVs, it does not exist because we have no odometer. We have no hour meter. But ABS may provide a solution to that. One of the things that I feel is if you look at um, a trailer that has a one-year, 2,000-mile warranty. And then you look at a trailer that has a two-year, 
6,000 mile warranty, immediately you understand these are not built equivalent. They are built with different purposes. They're built with different expectations. And you'll see that probably also reflected in a price tag. And I think that that right there is one basic thing that could completely reshape the way that RVs are presented to customers um, and, and, and shopped by customers. That technology exists. It exists right now. It's just not doing the thing that it could in the RV industry today. And that's one of those reasons why I'm super jacked up about the idea of ABS becoming more and more common. And that is uh, why we like watching your channel because Absolutely. you tell it like it is and you talk about these interviews. I never even thought about the warranty issue and what ABS, I mean, I knew about the the fact that it could track your mileage, but I never even thought about applying that towards something like a warranty. Yeah, because people don't really think about how am I supposed to use this? I recently was talking to someone, they're like, I'm going to take my 45 foot fifth wheel and go to Alaska. Well, that's a eight to 10,000 mile trip from South Florida round trip through bad roads. That's a lot of weight to be taken through what most would say are the roughest roads in America when you're leaving or not in America, when you're leaving Washington, like that's going to be a lot. And most likely your RV is not going to be in one piece when it comes out of there. Well, and it's nice to have that, like the, the knowledge because you know, people use the same RV, but for very different lifestyles. Like for us, we are weekend warriors, but we've talked to people who are, you know, buying very similar coupled campers to, to us, but they're living in them. So definitely you're, you're going to have some wear and tear. It's going to be different. And, you know, before we decide, Hey, I'm going to live in this rolling fort. Should we yep. in this particular rolling fork? But again, why would a consumer reasonably know to ans ask that question? I don't think consumers reasonably know to ask that question because uh, if, and again, this is where uh, some of the information I've put out in my videos in the past, I don't agree with today. You know, as I've learned more things, my, my understanding and the information that I provide has evolved. So, I, you know, I just continue to try to do my best to put this out there, but there is so much media to be consumed to provide you with this illusion of a dream of how you could just hook up to this thing and tow it all day, every day, anywhere you want, Hakuna Matata problem free. And uh, again, though, at the end of the day, that's not what they're des uh, designed for. And what's really, really murky, confusing, awful is a lot of that messaging isn't necessarily directly sponsored by like factory RV manufacturing agents. You could perhaps argue that it is indirectly sponsored through um, influencer third-party type partnerships. And uh, I, I, I would encourage consumers to do what they can to educate themselves, to insulate themselves from those kind of things, which I think anyone listening to this, that's one of the goals they're trying to do, so good for you. I would, I would encourage RV manufacturers to consider the messaging and the rhetoric that uh, is sometimes being presented out there. Like, don't don't get me started on this um, illusion of four seasons camping. That's a whole different thing that I'll get on. <laughs> I'll die on that hill. At the same time, dealers are not exempt from this conversation. I think for too long, and there are good dealerships out there. There are very good dealerships out there that do their best to educate, take care of their customers. Not all dealers are created equally, certainly. I've, uh, again, we're not perfect. Sometimes we had boneheads on staff too. Um, but dealers, I would say as a whole, on average, have been far too complacent to allow people to just believe what they want as long as you're willing to buy it from us. And mm -hmm. that is also a culture that needs to change. But as dumb as it sounds, I as funny as it sounds, I think um, ABS and just maybe even a, a different presentation of warranties uh, and including a mileage and or usage factor in a way that is very obviously known to customers will greatly shift a lot of the focus on things to help put in perspective what we're buying and what we're not buying. Yeah, people just need to, and, and it's hard because like you said, there's no information out there. They need to educate themselves as much as they can by getting on forums and talking to dealers and manufacturers and maybe making phone calls. I was recently on, on a Facebook group and someone was talking about they have, they were going to go 2,000 miles across the country with a 40 somewhat foot 
a toy hauler and they're like, I have a hundred and they, they're going to dry camp most of it. And they have a 156 gallon freshwater tank. And they're, and I'm like, I would not drive with 156 gallons of fresh water in your RV. That first of all, that's over 1200 pounds. I was just doing that. The math, you're adding yeah. right there. And they're like, well, the, and the, the exact answer to me is the manufacturer would not put such a big tank if we weren't meant to drive down the road with that weight in there. That is and, unfortunately But they don't know. True. And when you try to explain to them that it, it's like when you get close to where you're going, then fill up the tank. Travel with a little bit of water. And even a lot of manufacturers say don't even do that. But travel with enough to flush your toilets. But 1,200 gallons of water driving down the road is a lot sloshing around in your tank. But at the same time, I respect why they think the way that they think. Yeah. I don't fault them for thinking that. That's something where I think I've kind of, um, like, if you take, like, my FrameFlex video, it's 42 minutes. It's intended to be taken as a whole. There's a lot at the very end of the video that I think really puts a lot of it into perspective. It's a lot of the things that we've discussed here. But if you take minute two to three alone, it sounds like I'm pointing fingers at people. But then if you watch the end of it, I literally say that dealers, like me, are part of the problem. I, I don't know how much more fair than that I can be. On paper, it sounds like, what do you mean I can't put cargo in my truck bed? Why is it there? Like, I get why they feel that way. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not any less frustrated than they are. It's, it's, it needs, <laughs> it needs to be clarified. You know, as a consumer, I'm spending this well over $100,000 sometimes. Some of these things approaching $200,000 now. For two hundred thousand dollars, you can't you can't clear up the muddy waters a little bit. Well, Josh, we really appreciate your honesty, and and like we said earlier, like your videos are are what helped us make our decisions on our past purchases. And honestly, your videos, without disclosing what we're getting, are are the reason we chose the RV that we're purchasing and why we're going to be working with that company because of things that you have put out there. So, where can people find you so that they can also get this knowledge. I mean, I practically live on YouTube. I've got over 7,200 videos there. You can literally just Google Josh the RV Nerd and my YouTube channel comes up. I'm I'm not really hard to find. It's actually become kind of funny. I sound like I'm, I'm, I'm bragging here, but uh, I'll talk to people at an RV show and I'll mention to them, you know, I make videos on RVs and they'll go, I think I might have seen a couple of yours. There's a good chance if you've seen an RV video a couple times, one of them was probably mine. <laughs> I've been doing it for a while. And I'm not the only person that does what I do. And there's plenty of other good people. And just like I don't get everything right, I encourage people, go get go get plenty of sources of information. But YouTube's definitely where uh, I, I exist and thrive most commonly. I, I, I have little channels on some of the other social medias, but... That's that's definitely where I spend all my time. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time with us, Josh. And we will. I mean, we're we're going to be watching you forever. I mean, I, even though we know what we're what we're buying, like we always love pointing everybody to you because you are such a wealth of knowledge and you make it fun. Well, thank you so much. By the way, I think I have a name for your RV. It should okay. it should be named Voldemort because. It appears to be he who shall not be named in this podcast. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. And we're huge Harry Potter fans also. Well, I tell you what, one of the things that my family loves to do is we love to go down to Universal Studios and I call it getting butter drunk in Harry P Town. Um, <laughs> eat, drinking a butter beer with Harry Potter is always a good time. Do you see why we love him? I mean, he is just an incredible guy down to earth and as real in a lifetime video as he is when he's making his videos on YouTube. Yeah, he's just a real down to earth guy. And I love the way he presents information. I love the fact that he is honest with you. He is going to say like, listen, some of this may be consumer's fault, but I don't necessarily blame them. You know, like as I was mentioning the thing with the water, like most RV manufacturers, if you actually put their feet to the fire, will tell you like, listen, you probably shouldn't be driving with water down in your tanks when you're going down the road, but it's not written anywhere. You have to kind of pull teeth and, and understand the way these things are built. And if, if the RV manufacturers and the dealers would be more upfront about this, maybe us as consumers would be a little less upset when something happens if we really began to understand, okay, you know, it's probably not a good idea 
to take, you know, a 20,000 pound RV through the back country. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not designed to do that. And so I think that there's a little bit of fault that lies in everybody. Well, I think what's so amazing about Josh and rare, but it, it's makes sense that it's rare. He's cultivated um, a, a, a reputation within this industry for decades now. So he's in it for the long haul yeah. and the way he presents things represents somebody who is in it, not just for this fleeting moment in time, but for the future, right? And and I think that all of his videos are designed to give you the best information because sometimes the best thing that you could do is walk away from a particular camper. It doesn't benefit, um, you know, the RV dealership or the manufacturer for the wrong person to get into the wrong camper. I think that being the most honest you can be gets people properly matched up with the RV that's not going to be a headache for them or a lemon for them. It's going to serve the purpose that they're trying. Yeah, because what happens is, is somebody buys an RV. It wasn't the right RV. They're trying to use it for its not intended purpose. Right. And then what do they do? They become a keyboard warrior on a Facebook group, in Google reviews. And the next thing you know, that company has a bad reputation. Right. And some of it, is their fault. Some of it is the consumer's fault for not buying the right RV, but did they not buy the right RV because they had the wrong information? What's great about Josh is that even if the manufacturers and other dealers aren't prepared to bring it up to like perfect honesty, I feel like we're going to get it from him. So he's kind of a crusader on our behalf when it comes to getting more information, asking the right questions and knowing why they're important. So that is going to be the end of this video. I know it's a little bit longer than we originally intended, but Josh had some amazing information. So great. Do apologize because this will probably be coming out before we pick up our new RV of why we're not disclosing our RV. But the biggest reason is, is I've learned from a lot of friends who are in business is don't say what you're doing until it actually happens because what if something changes? Exactly. And so once we actually have what we're getting in our hands, then we can disclose it. But the last thing I want to do is say, hey, we're getting this and then something happened right. and we don't get it. So once that video comes out, you'll see that. So because of that, you definitely want to make sure you subscribe to the channel um, and hit the like button on this video because it really will help build our channel, but it also lets us know what kind of videos you guys are looking to see. And also don't forget to hit the little bell button and that way every single time we upload a new video, you'll be alerted to Until it. Until next time, happy, happy camping. camping.